नमस्ते सो दिस इज अबाउट अ क्वेश्चन दैट क्वाइट अ फ्यू पीपल आस्ट मी ड्यूरिंग माई रिसेंट ट्रिप एंड ओवर ई मेल व्हाट्सएप अबाउट द क्वेश्चन इन वन ऑफ द फिल्म विच हैज कम रिसेंटली द केरला स्टोरी सो एपेरेंटली आई हैव नॉट सीन द फिल्म बिकॉज द लिबरल्स एंड द टॉलरेंट पीपल है बैंड इट सो बिकॉज द लिबरल्स बैंड द फिल्म एंड द टॉलरेंट कुड नॉट टॉलरेट दिस फिल्म आई कुड नॉट सी इट एंड आई थिंक मेनी ऑफ माई फ्रेंड्स कुड नॉट सी एंड well that's a different story but i saw the clipping and there is a question which is asked so people who have seen the film so a lot of questions are asked uh, by vested interest of conversion those interested in conversion uh, they were trying to point out uh, holes and weaknesses of the hindu thought the thought of sanatan dharma and uh, we can take all these questions one by one but today this particular question which comes prominently even in the trailer the question is that a girl asks Uh, a hindu girl uh, a muslim girl as a hindu girl and she asks her uh, uh, who is your god which is who do you think is your god and she say well, i think shiva you say oh shiva who is carrying his wife with grief all over he is so much on grief how can he be your god so this is one question there are many others which we can pick up subsequently and somebody asked that now i am glad that there are hindu children who are asking yes yes we want to understand it so where is the fault line the fault line is that one in an average hindu home we have disconnected ourselves from sanatan dharma we are hindus that's true we do the rituals of the hindus but sanatan dharma flows from the veda and the upanishads and we are living in the age of the puranas so all the gods goddesses are of the puranas so i have seen even people when they talk they don't know that there is something beyond the gods within hindu sanatan dharma if you ask the vedas what do the vedas say ekamev dityam the one without a second and who is this one this one is beyond all shiva krishna brahma vishnu are his aspects but he transcends them he exceeds them all so we do have we have not just many gods we have this not just conception but i have to use the word conception because that's the word we use based on experience that there is one without a second one god but the beauty is as different or as opposed to many other religions which say there is one god but that is the god which is the one which we worship and my god who is exclusive to the believers sanatan dharma says there is one god but you can approach him in various ways so that god is very vast very inclusive and at the end he is regarded as anant apar agochar नेति नेति जा को श्रुति गावे ही इज इन्फिनिट गॉड्स ऑल्सो आर रिकॉर्डेड एज फाइनाइट इवन दे आर विड्रॉन ड्यूरिंग महाप्रलय इन टू द वन डिवाइन इवन दे आर अंडर ए काइंड ऑफ माया दिस ऑल देयर इन द स्क्रिप्चर्स वी हैव नॉट रेड इट इट्स आवर प्रॉब्लम बट दिस प्रॉब्लम इज अ सीरियस प्रॉब्लम सो अनंत apar you cannot know him he is beyond all description agochar you cannot behold him agochar is not just about seeing i must say here that there are religions based on heard voice of god but in india the vedic rishis not only heard the voice of god they saw god so that's why they are seers rishis they had the drishti and the shruti so it's not based only on heard heard is yes without a doubt we are not questioning that great exalted beings representatives of god can hear the voice of god not only one person but anyone who is exalted so we don't believe there is only one person who can hear the voice of god that's why you have so many rishis in the vedas but they also saw the truth 
So there is an additional faculty. It's like if you are blind and you hear, you can draw some idea of things. But if you are, can see and hear, you draw a much better idea. Not only you can hear and see, the Vedic Rishis also spoke about, you can not only hear and see God, you can taste Him, Amrit. You can touch Him. You can smell Him. That's why there is a description of the atmosphere which is around the God. You can love Him. You can understand Him if He allows, if He can reveal Himself. So there are many ways of approach. So this is one part. So when somebody asks, Who is your God? We should say, E kame vadvityam. The one without a second. And add, but unlike other religions, this God is approachable to the believer and the non-believer alike. This God, unlike many religions, is not only sitting above, but He is in this entire creation. He is in each and every creature, believer and non-believer alike. He does not hate the sinner and punishes them. He changes the sinner and turns them towards him. This is the Indian conception of God. Now let people decide which is better. Each one is free. But the conception of God, just see, he dwells in the entire creation. And not only he dwells in each person, not only he is beyond whatever we can, neti neti. There is no way you can, you cannot even qualify him. So you can qualify him through all the qualities. That's what most gods are described as. He is this, 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 this. But equally, you can say that none of these qualities define him. So it's one step further. He is both sagun with quality and he is nirgun without any qualities. He is beyond qualities and beyond absence of qualities. <laughs> See and yet he is described as Satchidanand, which means he is the one existent, he is consciousness, he is all knowing, he is force, chit contains both, and he is bliss. He is not a God who condemns joy, whether of music, poetry, art, as something evil, because he is Anandamaya. So this is Indian conception of God. Even beyond Satchidanand, the Indian rishis went further because where did Sachidanand come from? So if you read the Rig Veda, the Nasadiya Sutra, it's not about atheism. It says that there is even this being comes from Asat. Sat, Asat. You can't. There are two modes of the same reality. But you can't. There is no word, no limit which is what was captured in some of the ancient civilizations like Chinese, the Tao of the Chinese. is the same thing. The Shunyam of the Buddhist. You cannot describe him. This is the God of Indian conception. He is not a human God who is punishing people for doing this, doing that, etc. etc. Then there are the gods. Now we come to our Lord Shiva. So gods are cosmic beings and their movements cannot be understood by a small limited human consciousness. Now let's take first this example. So a child weeps for a chocolate. At that time the mother may also weep. She is denying the child the chocolate. Why is the mother weeping? Maybe because she feels, why is my child cannot understand that at 10 years, he still wants chocolates. It is going to spoil his teeth. Is the mother crying for the same reason as a child? Not at all. So as we grow in consciousness, the sorrow changes. It's, purpose, it's like when Buddha saw suffering in the world and he was filled with this sense of anguish. Was Buddha feeling suffering like an ordinary person? Oh, I have got sick. That will be foolish because that will never contain the energy for the yoga. He turns suffering into his strength. He is suffering because he sees the world is in ignorance. That is a different kind of suffering. Had he not suffered like that, had he been like the typical conception of God that people are suffering because they are sinners, 
kill them because they are non-believers. Would Buddha be Buddha? So imagine these two gods. On one side, the conception of a god. Now we are not talking of God with a capital G, but gods. A god who suffers when he sees this world that has rejected divinity. Who is Sati? Sati is the consort of Shiva. She is Shakti, none else. And the world has rejected Shakti and Shiva together. That is the problem. It's a very interesting symbolic story. Shiva is not an earthly being who is crying like an ordinary human. Shiva and Sati are beings of the immortal worlds as it is called. And we know the whole story. Shubhendra is immortalized in his parable of Mahadev and Sati. There in Bande Matram. So why Sati goes, he go, she, she dies? Because Prajapati, who is governing the laws of the world, see the beauty of this story. There are laws which govern creation. Everybody says, our God has given laws. You have to live according to this. Otherwise, you will be punished. But the Indian conception of the law, India also has laws, Sanatan, Dharma, Dharma. Dharma is not a rigid, fixed dogma. Dharma itself is very wide and plastic and subtle. And even there, it is not punishment but change. So there is in India, this idea of God who is beyond the law, who is Karuna Me, who changes things. Several stories of Shiva, you will see this. And many other gods. And beyond Karuna, there is Kripa. So the law is not ultimate. In typical religions, you have the law. You have to follow the law. The book has given the law. But this law for all times, for all kinds of people, for all humanity, and sometimes simply because you believe or don't believe, how silly it can be. So we to believe, Hindus believe there is a law. But this law, there is something greater than the law. And that is compassion. There is something greater than compassion and that is grace, kripa, karuna, kripa. So this, there is love, divine love. So religions which have stopped believing or a religion which believes that God can't weep. You see what happens? It throws away all the finest emotions. Even now let's take for a moment, I'll come back to the story. She was a human being. He is crying because his wife has died. And she has died because his, her father couldn't understand. So we want a God who doesn't understand this human feeling. It's a human feeling. So a God who doesn't understand this human feeling is not all-knowing. And what does that God, people who believe such a God, they become very hard. They don't understand tender care, love, feelings. So they can kill with impunity. Why? Because God is harsh. He has given the command, kill who doesn't believe. This is one conception of God. I am only talking of conceptions, not of religions. I don't know whether that was the original conception or not. That's not what I am talking of. But as it is an or a God who understands human suffering, I would prefer a God who understands my pain. And here it's not even about avatar. Which is different, there is no conception of avatar in, in Semitic religion. So God is only up there. But a God who understands, he goes through that human suffering and pain. This one. But Shiva's story is not about human suffering. He is a cosmic being and their pain is of a cosmic dimension. What is Shiva's suffering? It's not that I have lost my wife. He knows that he can, <laughs> you know, the whole universe at one level is the only male as is described. Is the only male. All nature is his wife. This is also there in stories of Shiva. He knows. He is Trikal Darshi. That she will do the tapasya and come back as Parvati. All this he knows. But he is crying for a world that has rejected the eternal. That is lost so much in the... See, what was Prajapati doing? Ritualistic law. In that law there is no space for freedom. Shiva is freedom. He stands for freedom. Now, Prajapati's world has no scope of freedom. That's why Prajapati's rules are very strict. Almost like some Semitic religions. So, Sati is told, you will not go in that territory. All these rules, he is running. 
and Shiva is freedom. Now Shiva's entry into that yajna means that in the framework of law you have introduced the principle of freedom. How beautiful it is! But Prajapati rejects. Prajapati is the guardians of the cosmos, and when he rejects, Sati plunges. So what happens after that? Now Shiva reveals. If you deny the eternal, you have no chance even of survival. The entire Prajapati whole system, his army collapses. Narayani Sena collapses. So why is Shiva crying? One is crying for a world that has rejected the eternal, but even more, very beautiful and touching. Who is Shiva? He is Nilkant. He swallows the poison. So when a world is destroyed by his Tandav, then there is lot of suffering that emerges. Destruction is not an easy task. It's a very painful task. Shiva knows it. That's why he has all compassion for all those who are into the game of destruction. That's why the serpents are dear to him. <laughs> of course, serpent is also about evolution because they carry poison within them. That's why the asuras are dear to him. And yet he cries because when all the pain that is thrown in a uh, in creation because of a whole civilization collapsing who has to swallow it? Shiva has to swallow it. So he draws the pain of civilization within himself. So our God gods, not the God is beyond suffering pain but there are gods who absorb the suffering and don't leave human being to suffer and be at the mercy of their own resources. So there is Shiva who is God deputed to this task. What is his task? He is to destroy. What does he destroy? He destroys, he doesn't destroy blindly or a non-believer, it doesn't matter. But he destroys a world where there is all determined by very dogmatic framework of fixed laws. You see all iconoclasts who have followed Shiva. Take Swami Vivekananda. Take Buddha. They destroyed the frameworks which denied that utter freedom. Shiva represents that. Shiva is not on a rampage trying to pick up, oh, you don't believe in me, I am going to kill you. On the contrary, we have so many stories where even Asuras, he has just given them boon. He is Ashutosh. But when the world becomes rigidly fixed in dogmas, narrow, which is what Prajapati represents, he destroys. But any destruction will involve pain because there are a lot of suffering is thrown. Shiva absorbs it. Shiva's vilap is that he is carrying the pain of the old world, epitomized in sati, upon his shoulders and moving into the quarters. Because this pain, until this pain is resolved, he absorbs that entire poison coming out from creation. He can't once again go back and sit and enter into his trance. So Vishnu knows it. So he starts destroying Sati. Meaning thereby, Sati has left a body. Why is Vishnu destroying? He could have simply picked up and... Now when the spirit escapes from a civilization... And this is going to be the fate of religions and ideologies also. When the spirit escapes and only a shell is left, now it is the dead body of Shati, the form. Vishnu comes to maintain the balance, he destroys the form. So we'll see that all these religions and civilizations, they are foredoomed to failure when the spirit escapes. Why India survived all this onslaught that took place in many of the religions? Because somewhere the spirit was kept alive. Even though it had become thin stream. But in some way the spirit was kept alive. There still were seers who spoke about Ekamev Dityam. There were still, still those who could see the divine imminent in the cosmos and within us. So it survived. But the forms are going to be destroyed. And so when the forms are destroyed, now Shiva enters into trance. Why? Because this is the time for Shakti Sanchay. Now a new creation has to emerge. And what is that new creation? That too Shiva has to do. Nataraj. Sri says, there are those who see Nataraj only the dance of destruction. 
but actually Nataraj is the dance of creation. So he releases creation because he is Pragya. If you take the Upanishadic sense, he represents Pragya in whom the seeds of creation are withdrawn and then they are released. So they according to one conception. And this is only about Shiva. There was another objection with re regarding Shiva in two short sentences we will cover it. Silliest of objection. That why he couldn't save you? Because a girl who believes in Shiva, apparently some gunda has you know, uh, tone a little bit of and your God couldn't save you. Well, it's stupid and silly, doesn't even deserve uh, a response. <laughs> because if that be the case, a whole believer group of people should be saved forever. This is not the case. It's every, <laughs> everybody dies, Hindu, Muslims, Christians, on the battlefield, good, bad. Now that's a very vast canvas. But better a God who may not have been able to save than a God who kills those who don't believe in Him. At least this God, for all His limitations, is a human. He, See, gods are beyond humans. But we have turned the God in certain religions below humans. A God who punishes with impunity. God who bans all that can give joy and music and laughter and art. A God who denies the sense of beauty in form and everything. Maybe some people are fond of that God. A God who cannot love and laugh and dance like our Krishna. That God may be good for the high skies. But he is perfect and is perfection perfectly useless for this world of sentient beings. He will never understand what we go through and the world today or tomorrow is going to reject such a God because that conception of God is going to only make the human heart more and more hard and harsh and lead humanity towards greater and greater cruelty. Now once again, I don't know whether this was the original conception and I am not entering into that debate. I have read, I have my own conclusions about it. But I am talking about the conception of God and who Shiva is, the being of cosmic dimension, trying to understand by a narrow, limited human frame, is like a child, two-year-old, calling his mama cruel or helpless. Why? Because she is not giving him a chocolate. And because she is leaving him to school to go through the training and uh, denying certain things. That would also explain why God is not all the time at your service to protect you. If you were to do that, how will you grow in your own strength? When mothers leave a child into the school, child has to go through his challenges. Mother is there to heal, to help and at times she will pick up the fight with somebody who is threatening the child. But most of the time, all wise mothers will say, Child, equip yourself, grow in strength, learn to take the challenge and respond back. Because I don't want you to be all the time doing an SMS to me and I just come there to save you. Namaste.